I believe this week's show will strike a very familiar chord with most of you listening, as there are a lot of us in this industry that are either the youngest of baby boomers or the oldest of Gen Xers that have watched the great resignation playing out and thought to yourselves, hmm, I wonder how close I am to reaching that financial bridge. But while I've been going through this process, I realized there was so much I didn't know or understand about the subject. I thought, is there something I can share with all of you that would benefit all those shop owners looking to start planning their own wind down, or maybe you're wondering the same things as me. Well, as a matter of fact, yes, there is. Welcome to the Mind Wrench Podcast with your host, Rick Sellover, where minor adjustments produce major improvements in mindset, personal growth, and success. This is the place to be every Monday, where we make small improvements and take positive actions in our business and personal lives that will make a major impact in our success, next level growth, and quality of life. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Mind Wrench Podcast. This weekly show is the personal and professional development podcast designed primarily for those serving the automotive repair industry, where we share simple yet effective strategies with personal and practical insights on mindset self-improvement and leadership that anyone can use for a more successful shop and a next-level life. I'm your host, Rick Silover. Thanks so much for tuning in and spending a few minutes with me today. I truly hope you find something of value here. If you haven't done so already and you really like what I'm sharing here, please hit the subscribe button so you never miss another episode. And make sure you share this podcast with others because when you share the show, the show grows and I get to help more people. And that's why I do this podcast. Welcome to my Finance Friday episode. I realize my weekly show comes out each Monday, so I should probably have called it Money Matters Monday or something like that, but you know what? It's my show, and I like the way Finance Friday sounds. So there you go. Pretend it's Friday. Anyways, I believe this week's show will strike a very familiar chord with most of you listening, as there are a lot of us in this industry that are either the youngest of baby boomers or the oldest of Gen Xers, that have watched the great resignation playing out and thought to yourselves, hmm, I wonder how close I am to reaching that financial bridge to traveling the States, fishing or playing golf almost every day, spending time with my family and friends instead of clocking in, right? I mean, we all have probably been thinking those thoughts the last year or two. Well, I, for one, after turning 60 last year, decided, wouldn't it be nice to know for sure how much longer I actually needed to work full-time. Not that I want to stop working. I mean, I enjoy helping others and being part of this industry. I'm not tired or worn out. In fact, quite the opposite. I have more energy now than I had when I was in my 30s. But once your mind starts going down that bunny trail, you kind of need to follow through until you have that answer. Or, you know, your number. We all have a number, don't we? Yes, we do. So I've been on this financial journey for several months and have talked to many of my friends in this industry, and, and they all start their sentences with the same thing. Well, my financial guy says, and I started thinking, wait a minute, how come I don't have a financial guy? I mean, I've been investing for decades. You know, I got a 401k, a few other things, but I don't have a financial guy or a trusted advisor. So I decided it was high time I found one. I started talking to many of them have learned a ton over the past several months, and now finally settled in on one person, and I now have a financial guy that I feel comfortable with and have trust in. And I asked him those two critical questions everybody asks. Number one, do I have enough to stop working and live off my investments for the next 20 years or so? And number two, should I have my investments in different buckets than they're in now? I mean, unless you do the digging, you really don't know, Right. Well, I got my answers. Number one, no. I mean, I'm closer than I thought, but definitely no. And number two, yes. Well, now I have my answers, and now I know what I need to do. But while I've been going through this process, I realized there was so much I didn't know or understand about the subject. I thought, is there something I can share with all of you that would benefit all those shop owners looking to start planning their own wind down, or maybe you're wondering the same things as me? Well, as a matter of fact, yes, there is. This week, I have a special guest that is a well-seasoned financial advisor, a financial technician that specializes in our industry. 
Someone that has great, useful advice specifically for auto repair and collision shop owners. Matt DeFrancisco is the owner of High Lift Financial Services, and their motto is Aligning Family and Business for Generational Wealth. Matt's a friend of mine and also a fellow podcaster. His weekly show, Your Business, Your Life, is dedicated to helping our repair industry as well. This was my interview with Matt. I hope you find some great value and some useful tips that allow you to make some better decisions when it comes to your financial future and your business's legacy. Well, let's get to the interview with Matt. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said to yourself, how come I'm not further along than this? Or why can't I ever seem to get ahead? Are you frustrated with life, unsure of your future, wanting to make a change in your current situation, but too scared to make that next move? Maybe you want to reach that next level in life or in your business, but not sure what the right move is. Or maybe you feel the best thing to do is nothing at all. Many of you may not know, but along with hosting my own weekly podcast, I'm a personal development, mindset, business, and life coach, where I focus on helping people with self-development, mindset, and how to make positive changes in their lives. And trust me, with all the negativity we've had to deal with these past two years, I think we all need some positivity, a positive change, and a fresh approach to our life or our business in 2022. Sometimes, talking to the right person can make all the difference. If you really want to start making those changes in your life, take action right now. Reach out and email, text, call, or direct message me as soon as possible. Do it right now. I'll set you up with a free consultation call and pre-qualify you for either the one-on-one or business coaching that you really need to get your life or your business on the right track to success. Appointments are available right now. If you're looking for personal, mindset, or business coaching, this month I'm running a special. 50% off for new clients for your first 30 days of coaching. If you're interested, just click on the link in my show notes. That's a free 30-minute discovery call and 50% off your first 30 days of coaching. You'll never know how beneficial coaching can be until you try it. But act fast. End of the month will get here before you know it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Mind Rich Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Siloper. Today, I got a very special guest. Uh, and he's going to discuss a very important subject, uh, one that's probably very critical to every business owner and close to their heart. Today, we're talking finances. So I am not an expert in finances. I'm the furthest thing from it. So what do I do? I get an expert in here. So today, my special guest is Matt DeFrancesco. He is the owner and financial technician for High Lift Financial Services. Uh, They are a financial services company that prides themselves on uh, helping uh, shop owners align family and business for generational wealth. Now, Matt spent his career, and he'll dive into that a little bit, I think, but uh, he spent his career in financial services, and uh, he's also got a podcast called Your Business, Your Life. Uh, he's He's had for the past two years, and that's actually where I met Matt. So we've known each other a little while. Uh, we've had lots of conversations. He's a uh, Fantastic, a quality individual. He's got a lot of knowledge. And this is just something that we don't talk about a whole lot. And I thought this is a great, great time to have a podcast uh, specific to generational wealth and, and handling your finances from a, a business owner standpoint. So with that, Matt, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. And uh, please tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got into this, this piece of the business specializing in automotive repair and collision uh, services. Oh, no, I'd be happy to. And first off, Rick, thank you for having me on. I mean, it's it's really an honor. Uh, like I said, you know, like Rick mentioned, I had him on my podcast. We had a great time and we are now working uh, with a with a, a group of uh, experts in the area on some really exciting things that I think we're going to highlight here, too. So yeah, but- maybe we'll get a little tease on that later. Oh, of course we'll do that. Well, of course we'll do that. So, so how did I get, uh, how did I end up here? Well, I, I will correct one thing. I haven't spent my whole career in financial services. So uh, just so everybody knows, I grew up in a, I grew up uh, through a, in a family business it was actually, it was a law practice. My grandfather started it. My dad was part of it, my uncle. And so I kind of grew up and I saw a lot of the dynamics within the family business, which, you, uh, you know, those that are in those type of businesses know that they are different animals. There's egos, there's emotions evolved. So um, there's a, a lot of different things to handle with that. You know, 
after that, you know, after going to college, I, I did a number of different things. I worked, I was, a, I was actually a professional photographer. I did a commercial and uh, a freelance photojournalism. And I worked for a, um, uh, another a guy, a photographer who they had a family business. So I kind of worked in that family business and then um, did sales for a while in a number of different areas. And a lot of times those family businesses were my, uh, were they were my customers. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I actually about 15 years, about 16 years ago, it's now uh, I got involved in financial services and um, I really just did. I, I really I'm not sure why I actually got into it. I think the bottom line was I, I saw it as a way that I might be able to help people. So I started with one of the big wirehouse firms and, you know, I went through all the training and I remember I got out of training and uh, I came into the office that Monday. And I sat down and um, I sat at my desk and I'm going, I have no idea what to do. So I walked back to my, uh, I, I walked back to my, my branch manager and I said, uh, what am I supposed to do? He goes, pick up the phone. So, <laughs> so I'm like going, yeah. <laughs> so I had like access to no money whatsoever. I mean, normally in, in financial services, people that get into it, uh, have maybe the family wealth that they can manage to get them started or they go to start with a big team. And I had none of this. Right. So I was like, basically like picking up the phone and just like calling people and say, Hey, you know, you ever think about retirement, those type of things. And what happened was I knew two things. I knew I learned, um, well, I knew municipal bonds really well mm -hmm. and, uh, municipal bonds, you know, again, they're it's tax free and uh, tax free money. And then I learned 401k plans. So that's really how I built my business with no X money. I'd spend all day cold calling or cold walking businesses. Mm -hmm. Do you have a retirement plan? Oh, when's the last time it was evaluated? You know, as a fiduciary, you're responsible for these. Uh, oh, you don't have one, you know, the tax advantages to it. And then I'd spend all night calling docs and selling them uh, university of Pittsburgh medical center, triple a uh, muni or double a muni bonds at five and a half percent, which is all tax free. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got started in the business. So I started selling these, these 401k plans and usually it was the small family owned businesses. And then they became clients and they started learning some of the intricacies. And so I started, they started coming to me kind of be, you know, being more of like their point person. And that's, you know, and I, I really enjoyed working in depth with them. So I ended up, but I, they, they were working for a big wire house. I couldn't compliance kind of, uh, you know, they, they basically handcuffed me in a lot of different ways. So I started my independent firm. And so it was specialized in small to mid-sized family businesses. And out of that, I started picking up a couple uh, collision and mechanical auto shops. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed working with them. And I really found it to be an underserved niche. I yes. said, you know, most of the times the problem is, is that I think most advisors that are out there are out there basically to sell product. OK, that's what I found when I was when I was working with the wirehouses, I was basically I thought I was out there and I was doing the right thing for the client and helping. And what I found out was I was really just a glorified salesman for the firm. I mean, my right. branch manager every month, he goes, what's your number this month? And I'm thinking, well, my number is to help my clients, you know, but that's not what the answer they wanted. Like how right. much production, how much revenue was I going to drive? So anyway, so being independent, I could now focus more. And then I found this specific niche within the uh, collision industry mm -hmm. and finding it being a really underserved. So that's basically kind of the story on how I got involved in, in this niche. Oh, okay. And, and that's great. And uh, listen, you hit the nail on the head. It is an underserved industry. Yes. I think specific to financial. Right. Um, uh, you know, if you know, we've talked about before is there is a lot of collision owners that were technicians and they grew up and they bought their own shop and, right. and they've, you know, been struggling out a, a nice uh, living. Uh, some do great, some not so well, but the thing is, is most people haven't been through you know any kind of financial training. Right. And now there's a lot of them that are my age, you know, they're close to that 60 or 65 mark and they're going, okay, well, man, I'd really like to stop doing this soon, but you know, I'm just realizing now in my own life that uh, I start talking to some financial advisors and man, there's a lot you need to know and there's a lot you need to oh, yeah. plan for. Right. Uh, and without that information, you're, you're kind of screwed. You may be stuck working another 10 years because you didn't plan things out early enough. Right. Or you didn't right. gain the knowledge early enough. So mm -hmm. um, that's great that you got into this industry. Um, what, what do you see are probably the biggest financial concerns right now facing shop owners uh, specific to collision, uh, and uh, automotive repair. 
Yeah. You know, it's interesting. And I, I think this kind of leads into why, why this niche, you know, I, I get, I get the clients, especially shop owners who are always like, well, you know, why you don't have any shop experience. And like I said, you know, I kind of started developing this little core group somehow just, um, you know, of, of these collision and mechanical shop owners. And, but what I found was about 70% of them are family owned. Mm -hmm. And um, they're independent, they're family owned, they're people, they're, they're down to earth people, they're grinders like me. I mean, it's like, you know, they're, they, they're pushing cars through the shop. Let's, let's get them in, let's get them out. And like you said, they're great technicians, but a lot of times they're, they're not great planners. And so what happens, and it's kind of what you, you highlighted is they get to be about our age, you know, I'm 57. And, uh, you know, probably early, mid fifties to 60, you know, to 60. And finally they kind of come up from under the hood and they go, holy crap. Like, what am I going to do? Do I retire? What, how do I retire? Do I sell the business? Do my kids take it over? Um, you know, can they run it? Are they going to be able to run into the ground? What's my role? And, And they just, they have no idea what to do. And I think that's, really the key. I, you know, I tell people all the time, I said, you know, I'm probably 10% financial guy because the financial putting the piece of the puzzle in the financial picture is pretty easy. Once you know what the solutions, uh, what you want, what, what you're solving for. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been doing this long enough. I know we do this and this and this and this, but 90% of what I do is probably more being a psychologist, getting into people's heads and helping them to navigate what is truly important to them and what are their fears and what are their concerns and then helping them navigate through that. So I think that's really the biggest thing is that they have no plan. And all of a sudden, and I I think, you know, now we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, we're seeing a, a huge push on consolidation, selling out to MSOs and, you know, but when I talk to some of my clients, they think that that's the only option that they have. Mm -hmm. And when I start talking to them about as well, where, you know, where do your kids stand? Do they want to take over the business? And I find out they've never had that conversation. Right. And that's, I think the big differentiator is that what I try to do is, okay, let's bring the family together and let's start getting input from everybody. And let's find out what's really important, not only to the shop owner, but also to their family. And we may find that, yeah, the kids do want to take over the business, but they have no idea how to run the business. Okay. Because Mm -hmm. mom and dad figured they'd learn it through osmosis or mom and dad were so busy, you know, grinding away and pushing cars through the shop that they never really taught them. Well, great. Okay. So you guys want to take it over. Let's bring in, let's bring in people that can help to train you to do that. And, you know, uh, or let's say they say, well, you know what? I love working on cars. I hate the business end. All right. Well, then what do we do? Is there another family member that likes the operation side? Is there maybe a key guy in the business? So we help them to create this vision for what they want their family to look like. And then how does the business fit into that? And then I can help them to put a plan in place to create that strategy for them to be able to transition the business. My whole goal is to create generational wealth. All right. And when I start talking, clients have never in the, especially in the collision industry, they've never thought about that. And all of a sudden, when you say, well, how would it make you feel if you knew that what the work that you put in today is going to last through your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids and your great, great grandkids. And all of a sudden they go, really? Right. That's, that's pretty appealing. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, nobody wants to think that far out, but you know, nope. ultimately probably need to. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's funny that you say that, that the, the financial part is kind of the easy part, putting all the things yeah. together. It's the mental game, right? So mm-hmm. um, I know just in my own life, you know, starting to talk to financial planners, because I started thinking about, okay, what am I going to do? You know, I've got some, some of this and some of that, but how do I, how do I manage that? What should I be doing with it? I don't know. Most people don't know what they should be doing with their 401k or whatever mm-hmm. IRAs they have as they get to this age. Right. Unless they've gone through some financial training when they're, you know, in school or something like that. But most people like me, I would imagine that scares the crap out of them when they start to right. think of it. Cause now they're, now your, your mind just goes bonkers. Like, I don't know what fees and, and what interest rates. And I, I don't know how all this stuff works. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a huge, huge advantage to, to at least have somebody that's in this industry that can help guide that conversation, guide that thinking through 
okay, what kind of decisions do you need to make? Uh, and right. I, like I said, I, I just went through some of that with a financial planner and he helped me think about things a little bit more clearly. It's, mm -hmm. it's not as scary as it seems when you start talking through it and right. going, okay, I've got this. I'd like to be able to do that. How do we do that? Right. And those mm -hmm. are the kinds of things you can do with the, uh, with the shop owner and their family. Right. Right. True. But you know what? The question that I get, because I talk to clients about wants and needs and all those things. But what I really want to know is what's the what's their concerns? What's the thing that keeps that keeps them up at night? As I always say, I, you know, I help my clients uh, achieve the things that they want to achieve and avoid the things that they pray never will happen to them. And that's a real key thing. I mean, you know, it comes down to like, you know, how, how do we manage risk? I mean, you know, death is one thing, but what about disability? What about all of a sudden, you know, like you said, change in interest rates and you've got, you know, buildings and property that are financed and how do you manage those things? And then how does this fit into, because that's the one, that's the one thing that you create when you start creating this family vision is all of a sudden you can open up a Pandora's box on a lot of things. And, you know, and one issue I think that most advisors, financial advisors miss is the uh, how much taxes are truly going to cost you. And I, it's funny. I mean, yeah, that's an area I think that, that again, the collision industry is really underserved. I was having a conversation with a guy a couple of weeks ago and, you know, we were, I was asking him, I said, you know, what's your biggest concern? He said, taxes. I said, Oh, really? I said, then tell me about it. And he said, well, he goes, he goes, you know, last year I had a hundred thousand dollar tax bill. And I said, well, what did you do about it? And he's like, well, he goes, I'm building some calibration centers. And I'm like, oh, I said, good idea. Yeah, I'm just using them. I'm just going to depreciate them. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. This makes no sense to me. I mean, yeah, depreciation's great. But once you've depreciated the building, now you're done. Now we got, what do we do? We're going to build another one and just keep adding on, you know, these pieces of property. And it, there's more efficient ways to skin a cat. Transitioning the business. This is a great example. I mean, you know, most business owners, again, they're like, okay, well, I'm going to go sell to a consolidator or to an MSO. And so they think, yeah, great. I need, you know, I need, let's just say I need $5 million for mm -hmm. my, that, that's because this is what shop, this is what really almost every family business does. They go to a number. They say, okay, I want to have this much income. So I'm going to need this much money. So that's, that's how they set their selling price. They never do a business, a true, a, a, an accurate business evaluation or business valuation. Uh, they never have experts come in and look at the business and say, you know, improve this. We can do that. No, right. they just manage the number. So all of a sudden somebody comes to them and says, yeah, I'll pay you five, $5 million for it. And they're like, great. I did it. Yeah. What they forget is, uh, guess what? There's this little thing called taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, and usually a lot of times how these deals are worked out is usually lump sum up front and then payments over time. So lump sum up front, guess what? You're going to pay 20% in capital gains. Okay. So right. there's 20% gone. Now they're paying you over the rest of it over whatever five year note, 10 year note, whatever that is. Oh, yeah. Well, we're going to minimize the tax liability, but guess what? Now you're paying ordinary income tax on that. So you can very easily lose anywhere from, you know, 20 to 40% of all that money. Now, all of a sudden your $5 million is only worth three and now you're not at your number. Right. Okay. So these are little, little intricacies that the shop owners don't really understand. And, you know, again, sometimes they're like, okay, it's easier for me just to take the check, but maybe the kids, if they want to take over the business, do you realize that they can actually use gifting strategies and almost pay no tax them or their kids? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that too. That was one, yeah. of, the, one of the things I was thinking about is, okay, there's, listen, I, I deal with shops for, for decades and, and there's so many shop owners that have, you know, two, three, four kids. And I ask them, Hey, so is, you know, is junior going to take over, you know, in a couple of years or five, 10 years? No, I don't want that son of a bitch running my shop or he's too lazy. You know, it, it, they'll always say, uh -huh some things about, you know, they don't want their kid to take over or the kid's not interested. I'll just sell to, there's so many consolidators. I'll just, I'll just sell to one of those and I'll, I'll get what I want out of it. But right. I don't think they stop and think about, okay, well, to your point, how much are they going to pay in tax? If they sell to an MSO or even a small consolidator, or even just one other single business owner that wants right. two shops, there's going to be a huge difference between that. than if he convinced one of his kids, Hey, why don't you take this over higher in maybe the right people to help you run it. But mm -hmm. you know, you're building some legacy for you and maybe your kids. Right. And meanwhile, pops is going to save, you know, enough on the tax stuff to, uh, 
maybe buy that piece of property he wanted or buy the boat that he wanted to retire on. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there that maybe just doesn't get thought through before right. they, you know, uh, the big MSO calls and they go, Hey, maybe I'll sell to them. You know what I mean? And then right. they don't even know which road they're going down at that point. And that's it. And they've never really, the possibilities have never been opened up to them. And I think that's what I really try to do is to get them, you know, I utilize a lot of different initially when, you know, after we've kind of done an introductory call, I'll have them do an assessment and that assessment will identify different areas that are big concerns for them. And every time I do this assessment, it's pretty amazing to me how these shop owners are like, wow, you know what? I never really thought about that, but that's right. I mean, that's like, you know, here's a great one. What happens if you get hit by a car tomorrow and you're either killed or you're severely you're inca incapacitated where you can't run the business? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Do you have a written continuity plan if something should happen? Does everybody know where all your stuff is? Operating agreements, um, you know, the combinations to the safe, extra keys, uh, insurance policies. I mean, all these things. Does anybody know that? And, and so that might be the, the initial step that I work with a client is let's I'll help you to develop a business continuity plan. All right. But then maybe it is family succession. And it's like, you know, I didn't realize this was that important to me. Now, that's again, we need to have a conversation with the family and find out where was all their interest? And then and maybe we include key employees too, because may, you know who knows? And maybe there's a family member that doesn't want to be a part of the business. They have an interest somewhere else. How can we incorporate that? And I call it the family umbrella. And right. so you have these multiple cash flow streams that all are meeting the needs of different family members. And this is how we create this family wealth that, that we can pass on from generation to generation. Oh, that's, yeah, I like that. And quite honestly, uh, you know, selfishly uh, being in this industry all my life, yeah. uh, I prefer to see shops be handed down to uh, their generations rather than sold right. to an MSO. Uh, I think uh, independent collision center owners and auto repair industry owner, uh, repair shop owners, um, I like to see them hang on to their own independent shops or pass those independent shops on to, uh, right. to relatives that keeps that sector of our business going. Cause yeah. if, if we don't, if that doesn't happen and everything becomes MSO, you know, it kind of degrades the whole pot, the whole quality level of what we've done as professionals for many years. Right. So, right. um, I would ask you, Matt, if you're, uh, if you're assessing somebody that hasn't done anything, he's 55 years old, he's going, you know, what, Matt, I got a pretty good business here. I think I'm doing good financially. Not 100% sure because I'm not really sure what my net profit is, but I got a feeling it's pretty good because there's always more cash at the end of the end That's of the right. month. That's right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And it's and it's sitting in my safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe what are the, some of the basics they should start doing now just to start moving in the right direction? Like you mentioned, you know, talking about you know what what happens if I die tomorrow or if I get injured? Is there like maybe three or four basic steps that they should start working on now that any shop could do? to start preparing for that, to be at least a little bit more prepared for that transition right. as they start meeting with someone like you or anybody in this industry that's, that's looking to help them with that. So, right. Right. Well, I, I would say the first step is that you need to identify for yourself what you want. And, I, but I think again, to do that properly, you need to bring the family together and talk to them about what they want too, because what they want is going may, maybe we'll determine what you really want too. So I, I'm a big proponent of the family meetings starting to open up uh, open up conversations in that area, and it's kind of the starting point that I use with my clients. But the, I, I'm I, I want to give you fair warning on doing family meetings is you know shop owner do not run it for yourself. Okay, okay? find a trusted advisor, somebody that you know that can kind of moderate the meeting and 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 kind of make sure that everybody's getting their input, that if things start to get elevated, they can drop it back down uh, because these will get emotional. I'll tell you, you know, um, I was I, I had another client. This was outside the collision industry. They had a propane business and we were running family meetings. And it was pretty amazing to me because um, the wife after I think our first or second meeting came up to me and said, Matt, she goes, um, I thank you so much. You know, Jeff never had this opportunity to get to give input when his, when it was just he, he, when he was the kid and dad and and his uncles were running the business. Mm -hmm. And so they really appreciate like all of a sudden. And, and, and so it's amazing. 
one of the key components of, of trying to put together a vision is you have to start with a foundation of trust. And I think having these dialogues allow you to start building that, that foundation of trust. But what the, and the reason I say have a trusted advisor to moderate these meetings is I've had clients that took my advice and then all they get back to me and said, Hey, I had one of those family meetings and it was a disaster. And you know why? Because nine times out of 10 dad's running the meeting. Right. Okay. Dad's got his own agenda dad, and he's used to driving all this stuff and kind of being the leader on it. And he's not willing to listen to when there's some pushback. And so the right. things blow up, you know, that's why having a moderator in there is really key because I think that's really the starting point is, is, is getting everybody's input because that'll give you a clear picture of what you, what you want. I mean, I'll give you a great example. You know, one of my clients who's got a collision shop met with them. Um, Actually, I met him on an airplane, he and his wife, and we mm-hmm. got talking. He asked me you know, what I did, and I told him, and, and he said, oh, do you do business successions, business succession planning? I said, well, yeah, that's what I do. And I'm thinking it's the structural stuff. And so he gives me his card, and we return from our trips and I, I meet with them and it was really like, you know, Hey, I just don't know what, you know, I, I, I think I want to retire in five years, but I'm not sure my kids are in the business. I don't know if they're capable of. And so as I started to work with them and help them to identify these, um, you know, what was truly important to them and working with the kids and finding out what was truly important to them, he's now gone to the point where he's like, well, you know what? He goes, I want to have more flexibility. Okay. I want to be able to go hunting out West and fishing Mm -hmm. and um, you know, I want to ride my motorcycle, but, but I still like working in the business and he's very entrepreneurial and he, and he likes to start other businesses and uh, he still wants to be a part of the business. So he's just now where, where we are now is we're transitioning his one son and this key guy are the leadership team. They're probably going to end up doing the, more of the day-to-day operations. He'll be working more as a consultant. And what we'll do is we'll slowly be gifting over shares to the family members. Okay. Mm-hmm. And to the key and, and then the compensating the key guy too. All right. So that he's right. getting, so there's a lot of equity, uh, uh, um, equality in the deal. Right. Okay. And the other, but the other thing we have to look at is, okay, he's got another son who's not in the business. All right. He's not, a, you know, um, just, it, 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 he just, he didn't like the business. And he is, so we ended up having him leave, but you know, if parents want to be fair and they're like, okay, if I'm handing over a $5 million business to one kid, um, I got to do something for the other. So then helping them to structure plans that help them to do that. We're helping them to start another company because the kid likes construction. So we're looking to start those type of things. So again, it's helping them to develop those plans. And I think the other key thing is that, and this is one of the, I think, big values that at least my clients tell me is, so I help them to, to create this plan. I monitor and help them to execute the plan, especially as situations arise, because you know, as well as I do, Life throws us wrenches and, yes. and we, um, you know, we have to sometimes adapt and, 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 and kind of change gears as, as, so to speak. Right. And so that's where I'm able to help them. But also because of my network, I can kind of be that person when it's, if they have in a situation that's outside my area of expertise, I've got a team that I can bring in to, you know, to basically help them. Great example. I'm not an ops guy. All right. I'm not an operations right. guy. That's not my, that's not my deal. I've never run a collision shop, but I could bring somebody like you in, Mm -hmm. right. To say, Hey, they need to, to, they, they, they operationally, they need to make changes to raise the value of this business. Mm -hmm. And so I would bring a coach in to do that. Um, Maybe there's some family strife. Okay. Maybe they need some counseling. I have counselors on my team that I can bring in. You know, if uh, they've got HR problems, I mean, most shops that I deal with, they don't have an HR department. Right. Okay. They but guess need what? One, but they yeah. And, and guess what we're dealing with? We're dealing with, you know, uh, you know, OSHA regulations. We're dealing yep. with drugs, you know, uh, people that have drug problems. I mean, there's all kinds of HR problems that are out there. Well, guess what? I've got HR consultants we can bring in to help them to navigate all that stuff. So I, I not only am I helping them to develop the plan, but I'm also coordinating the solutions that are outside and kind of being that point person for them. Right. So that's, and, and the, the thing that they've told me is they love having only one person to call. They got a problem. Call Matt. They call right. me. They said, okay, you know what? I've got, a, I got a buddy of mine, or I got somebody on my team that can help us with this. Let me get, let me connect to all of us. And then we solve the problem that way. 
Right. No, Matt, I, I would agree with you hundred percent. You've got a, you've got a great circle of influence around you. You've got really good connections like, like Laura and Mickey and some of the people that we, we talk with a lot mm -hmm. that can help in different aspects of this. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with your point that, um, you know, me dealing directly with collision shops for, you know, 30 years, mm -hmm. um, it seems like they always want one point of contact. Okay. Mm -hmm. Rick, I want to know, uh, whatever goes wrong, I want to be able to just call one guy. Is that could be you or is that could be somebody else. So right, right. I always, you know, I liked being that point guy because then you can bring in the resources that you need to bring in. And, right. and for some reason, especially in the collision business, they like having just that one point of contact. And I think it's just, it's easier for them to not think, okay, do I call the vendor in? Do I call the manufacturer? Do I call the equipment guy? Yep. Nope. I'll just call that dude right there and uh, he'll take care of stuff. So exactly. Yeah. No, that's a good spot to be in, man. And I didn't realize that that you did that much within, uh, within your business and oh, what yeah. you do. So oh, yeah. that's, uh, that's a great, uh, a great spot to be in. I think that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, and that's what the team's all about. And that's what I look at it. I mean, none of us can be experts in every area. Right. So it, it you know, when we take a team approach, uh, it just benefits everybody in the long run. Right. So, um, the top tips are really is to number one, get a vision of what you want to do. Okay. Where, where you want to be and include your family, mm -hmm. uh, and then bring in a, a guide or a coach that can help get you through that portion of bring a moderator. in. so, right. Um, and I totally get it. I've dealt with enough owners that, you know, if they have a family meeting, it's going to end up with, uh, with, uh, <laughs> hurt feelings, yeah. a lot broken, of blood, maybe some and blood, blood and beer, some broken yeah, stuff yeah. in the house. I, right. I get it. So yeah, I think that helps to have a moderator. Yeah. And then really think through, you know, what, how do you want to end up, you know, do, right. you, do you want your family running these businesses or do you just want to be done with all of it and, you know, be on an Island somewhere uh, by yourself. So, I mean, right. and it, for some people, that's what they're going to want. So. Exactly. Um, and that's cool. And that's yeah. cool. And we'll help you to uh, accomplish that. But uh, again, I think most of the times we, they think that's the only option that they have Yeah, and they do have other options. And then the structure of the deal can be done in ways that can be very tax efficient, maximize dollars and accomplish the things that they want, uh, that they want to accomplish. And, you know, it's like I said, yeah, collision industry is an interesting animal because in a lot of under uh, other industries, like just even valuing the business, it's usually a multiple of um, it's it's a multiple of either revenue or EBITDA. Collision industry is completely different. Yes. I mean, you could have two shops that are both doing, uh, let's say, two million dollars a year. That would be valid completely different based off their locations, based off their special specialities, based off of key men that they may have, based off their equipment, based off of, um, you know, what uh, OEM certifications that they have. I mean, right. so so these businesses, even though they're doing the same revenue, can be valued completely. Where are they located? Right. I mean, I'm I I I I live in West Central Pennsylvania. It's more of a rural area, mm -hmm. and you know uh, that rural rural shop might not have as much value as one that's based in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or uh, or in Tampa or, or you know wherever you know wherever you may be looking. You know right. Santa Bar or, you know Santa Barbara. So that's the other thing that we try to do is help them. Let's find, let's get a general sense of what the true value is. And then if we have time, maybe if selling it is, is maybe that's where we need to say, how do we increase the value of the business? Right. So is there any um, key financial or tax uh, changes coming up immediately? I know, I think I <laughs> talked to Laura Gay a, a little less than a year ago, and she was talking about the Biden tax uh, changes that were supposedly, you know, could possibly come up this year. Right. And I haven't seen that that's happened yet, but is that still nope. in the balance? Is still hanging out there? Is that, uh, is there anything else like that that we uh, should be concerned about? History would tell us that, no, it's not going to happen because guess what? This is a midterm election year and yeah. politicians do not like to raise taxes during um, election year. So uh, I don't foresee that. I, the biggest challenge right now is rising is, is this inflation and rising interest rates. Okay. okay? Because, you know, um, what, you know, a lot of times as, as, as people get older, you get more conservative in your investments because you can't, you don't have the time to make up any uh, market volatility, but usually they do that with bonds. Well, guess what? 
I mean, yeah, interest rates come up and we think, great, I'm going to get more in yeah. interest, but the values drop. So it becomes very, um, if you're heavily in that, you can see portfolios take huge, huge dips. So interest rates and inflation, I think, are the two things, um, the, the two biggest things. And then I think this, the third thing is taxes, but down the road. Um, right. I have all my young people doing Roth um, you know, contributions in their 401ks or doing Roth IRAs uh, or building tax-free buckets of money that they can access in retirement because, and I don't think it's going to be as big of a factor for us, but you know, with $30 trillion worth of debt, we got to pay the piper at some point, And that's going to be through higher tax rates. And I can see my kids who are in there, well, everywhere from 18 to 31, they can have tax rates that, that might, you know, might be where they were pre uh, pre Reagan. Right. And the marginal tax rate. So, uh, you know, high tax rates in retirement. So now let's start building since the tax rates are lower. We don't need, we don't need the deductions right now. Let's build tax free income uh, pools that we can uh, access. So those are probably the three things I would say that are, that are biggest right now from a financial standpoint. Okay. I think once again, it is critical for, um, uh, for anybody listening, for any shop owners, uh, to make sure you at least uh, start diving into this a little bit because it's uh, the investment uh, model is not like what it used to be. And, uh, you know, we're all getting to that age where we really need to take a good look at what we're doing, yep. uh, where we want to end up and start building that path from point A to point B. And quite honestly, there's, there's a lot of us uh, in this industry and in life that just you know, we always put that off. Well, I'll get to yeah. that next week, next month, next year. Right. And uh, next thing you know, you're like, holy crap, um, I need to do something soon. And you're not mm -hmm. prepared. So yep, that's why I wanted to get you on here today. So at least yeah. everybody got uh, got a little snippet of the of what they should be looking at, what they should be doing. So what's coming up next for you, Matt? Uh, you got anything cooking? Any next moves you're going to make? Or you can expand your business or anything exciting well, going on for you? Right now, right now, there's uh, there's two things. So I'm actually um, I'm in the process right now of uh, becoming actually a certified exit planner. And what that means is that um, we're, it, it's a certification that then allows me to go out and help to develop exit plans for business owners. And yeah, so and. Now it's interesting because, you know, as part of our team, I've got people that do this. You, know, you mentioned Laura Gay. Mm -hmm. She's part of the team. Um, so kind of where that fits in is that, you know, Laura, again, is if somebody's like, look, you know, nobody wants the business. I just want to sell. I just want to get out. That's where I bring Laura in. She that's her expertise. That's what she handles. But, you know, as we do the assessments and the family meetings and all of a sudden, you know, they're like, no, we want you know, the family wants to keep this and we want to evolve with it. OK, mm -hmm. then I can help them to structure the deals in the most tax efficient and, and the easiest way, because most of the time the family members don't have the money to buy it. So right. how do we then how do we do this? And we, and we got to make sure that we would that we make sure the uh, the founders are whole. So. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the biggest thing is this the certification, which, you know, uh, I, I'm going to be uh, I'll be finishing it up uh, probably sometime in August. So I'm really excited about that. And I've got a lot of great tools, assessments that help us to really help those shop owners to identify what's important for them. I think the second thing, and you're part of this, too, is uh, so. I started this mastermind group with Rick and, and we've got a number of other industry, uh, uh, industry leaders in it. You know, Laura Gay's part of it, uh, Barrett Smith, uh, Mickey Woods. And one of the ideas that we came up with and we were taught as we were talking in this mastermind was that, you know, there's a lot of shop owners out there who just don't know where to get the answers. Mm -hmm. And so here we have this, we have this panel of experts in all of these different areas. And what would we, um, could we be able to create a forum for them to be able to come on and ask questions and pull the mastermind? You know, the whole idea mm -hmm. of mastermind comes from Napoleon Hill and think and grow rich. And it's this idea of taking a collective group of minds and pulling them together. And that multiplies the amount of brain power that you have. And it's right. exponentially. It's not just like, because there's six of us there that it's six times. No, it's probably 60 times right. because again, we kind of feed off of each other. So, so we've kind of created this, 
mastermind for a, a mastermind of masterminds. And we were talking about what to call it. And somebody came up with the idea. They're like, well, you know, like you go to these conferences. Okay. And you sit through these breakout sessions and it's like, oh, I just want to get out of there. And finally yeah. the day ends and everybody goes to the bar. Right. Right. And has a cocktail and they start relaxing. And that's where the magic starts happening. Yes. Because now we're sharing. So we decided to call it the collision cocktail hour because that's what we wanted to be. We wanted to be very low key where people can come in, ask questions and just kind of pull our brains and we can all have a discussion about it. And the power, because we've got all these collective brains, is I, I, I know being a part of many masterminds myself. And having run them, that they will get the answers that they need. Yep, and I get think clarity into this. Yeah, I, I'm really excited for uh, for us doing this. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to the feedback to see how that goes. But uh, yeah, I, the concept of it, I think, is uh, is much needed. It's unique to this industry. Yeah, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So you know, I think yeah. uh, I think everybody will have some fun with it. So. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It's, having it's, a cocktail it, 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 is not mandatory, but it's it's definitely optional. So that's yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so, and like I said, it's kind of it's just low key, but it's a place where the shop owner just wants to come on. Maybe you just want to listen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if you've got a specific question, like how do I navigate this and this, and I think it's more not so much along the lines of maybe a technical end. But more about more of the, about these ideas of vision. How do I navigate yep. this? Oh my gosh! You know the uh, the insurance companies through their DRP programs, or they're putting the hammer to me. I, I know there's probably a way to you know be able to maintain my integrity and right. do this, but I don't know how to do it. You know, and we can all discuss that and yeah. help them to get the solution to come come up with a solution. There's a, there's a lot of issues in the industry, especially when it comes to body shops. There's always lots of concerns and problems, and uh, hopefully we can help get some people through those things. And, uh, you know, like that, I like to think of uh, what we do is uh, we'll be saving the world one body shop at a time. One body shop at a time. That's exactly right. That's exactly, uh, and we'll be having fun doing it. Yes. So. We're, if nothing else, we'll have fun. So that's exactly right. That's exactly well, Matt, right. I think we're running low on time here. So I want to wrap this up. Where can everybody find Matt DeFrancisco? Ah, okay. The, the million dollar question. Yes. So very uh, easily go to my website, highliftfinancial.com. If you want to have a conversation, I want the first one thing I do is I always offer, I'll, I'll give anybody 20, 30 minutes of my time just to talk about your situation, see if there's a fit. So I do that. There's no cost, no obligation to it. There's actually, there's a button up at the uh, top left that said, let's talk. You can get on my calendar, find a time that's convenient for you. I'll be more than happy to chat with you. Um, you can also email me at matt at highliftfin.com. Okay. And um, I hope you put all this stuff. In I'll the show put notes. all those. Yeah. I'll put all those links in the show notes. Absolutely. So. And those are probably the best ways, but go to the website first, check that out. Like I said, you want to schedule time to chat more than happy to. Awesome. Well, listen, Matt, it's been great having you on today. Uh, a world of information. Uh, I, I think there's tremendous value in, uh, in what you talked about today. Uh, I hope all of our listeners get a chance to uh, digest some of that and go, Hey, you know, maybe I should give this guy a call. Cause I do have some concerns. So uh, thanks for sharing everything. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you soon. And to the listeners, thank you for listening today. Uh, greatly appreciate you uh, dialing in and uh, hope this uh, provides some value for you. So once again, Matt, thank you so much. I appreciate you and uh, have a great day. Well, that's all I had for you this week. I hope this Financial Friday episode helped get you thinking about what you need to do to ensure a smooth, advantageous way to either start your transition out or start building a solid succession plan to keep your business running successfully for generations to come. Matt has a servant heart and mindset and is always looking to help. Please feel free to reach out to him if you have any questions. I'll leave all of his contact information in the show notes. If you like this episode, please go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and rate it, share it, and leave a review. When you share this podcast with others, that's how we grow. And when the show grows, I can serve more people with my messages. I appreciate you, and I hope you have an awesome and productive week. I can always be reached at www.ricksillover.com, where you can find all my social media links, podcast episodes, blog posts, and much more.